All right. Um, yes, so, I mean, Dur and I are very, very happy that you're able to make it here. I have to say that um, last night I thought maybe the room looked a bit too big, you know, but clearly it's just the right size for, I think, all of you that have um, been able to join us and, you know, also a big welcome for people joining us online as well. So I'm gonna go through um, some of the updates from our global cluster, um, what we've been doing while you think we're just enjoying life in Geneva. Um, and then uh, we'll have some updates from the working groups and then I'll pass on to De to also welcome you and, and share some other updates. So, right. So since we last met in Geneva, 12 months ago, um, there are a couple of things that we've been kind of quite busy on and quite focused about. We talk a lot about improving visibility and awareness of CCCM as a sector, but also as a cluster. So there's been a number of um, public events, like for the first time we had a stall with the other cluster at edX in Geneva. We also part of a number of work streams within the global cluster coordination group. So trying to promote also the working across different clusters. Um, Dur and I particularly are members of the work streams around transition um, and non-activated settings on preparedness, on looking at cluster coordination reference modules. Um, and then, of course, we also engage, I mean, other than providing you with the support, we also work with other clusters to look at uh, field support and providing support to intercluster coordination group, for example, um, as opportunities arise. Um, the, our IM colleagues have also been hardworking and I think been in touch with many of you as well. Uh, we contribute to like global processes around joint intersectoral analysis framework. We also develop um, CCCM specific um, people in need and severity uh, framework and methodologies, making sure that we can also advocate for and represent the need of people who've been displaced um, in your different contexts. And because I think for our sector, we focus at the community level and sometimes it can be hard to work with others that, you know, they're reporting numbers at household levels. And then you're talking site numbers and people in displacement. So been, I think actually it's not just been last year, it's been over the last five years that we've been working quite hard to make sure that we can talk with other clusters and that what comes out in the humanitarian needs overview in your country, in the humanitarian response plans, also represents the need of people who end up in collective settings. So this is available on the cluster website if you uh, wish to, to check them out. Um, we also launched a really active campaign around the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Um, and thanks to inputs from many of you as well um, to share with us uh, your stories, what you're working on, and also for making sure that the GBV risk mitigation prevention also remain like the core of our good programming in CCCM. We also are quite lucky to be represented on the reference group for the IAC um, inter, um, independent review on humanitarian response to internal displacement. Uh, for those of you who some of you may have, maybe not, I think they did six country visits in uh, six, um, many of you are here. And the feedback from the review team on what CCCM has been doing in those countries is like, I know you're amazing. So, you know, it's just glad, I'm just so glad to hear it from others as well. And so you will see specific recommendations that came out um, focused on CCCM, not only recognizing that we may need to update our mandate to reflect what we're doing in the field. They mentioned the name of the cluster. This is something we can, you know, we will, we will be working on in, in the coming months and year between our two cluster lead agencies. Um, but it also makes sure that we're there when they want to talk about, you know, people-centered approach or urban responses to internal displacement. If you have time, I definitely recommend you having a look. There's a summary of recommendations, 
um, that uh, also give you a good idea on what the discussions in the global uh, forum has has been focused on. There's been a lot of number, a lot of translations that have been happening. I think the different working groups will also share with you the specific documents and videos and and other guidelines that have been translated, adapted, and adopted into different contexts. Um, we also had our, I think for the third year, we had our um, desk at the Humanitarian Network Partnership Week um, just two, three weeks ago as well in Geneva in May. Um, we hosted uh, four different sessions, but between Der and I, we've also been moderating, facilitating, participating in different panels and discussions that were organized by other, um, other clusters, but also other entities um, in the humanitarian sectors as well. Um, and then a labor of love for many of you here. Also, we've been working and have consulted with many of you also on developing the cluster coordination toolkit. I think this is long overdue, but I think it's it's a big piece of work. And I don't know if Kate Holland made it here, maybe not yet. No, um, but she's been and Joe and Bruce also have been like relentlessly harassing me and uh, um, about checking all the different documents and and making sure that. Uh, our toolkit is good to go for our both old and new cluster coordinators. Um, a lot of it links to other uh, sectors and other clusters as well because of the cross-cutting nature of CCCM. So this, I feel, is, is a very, very good um, kind of intro onto how to do coordination for, for a cluster like ours. Um, so now I'm going to invite our working group chairs and co-chairs and others to give quick updates. You have, what did I tell you? Do you have two minutes? Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm representing the Capacity Development Working Group and you will see a nice slide here from one of the webinars that we were able to hold. And we had a very ambitious way of thinking that we needed to do the entire, a recap of the entire um, training cycle. And we were only able to do one of those. And that was on learning needs assessment. And we focused on two really interesting countries uh, and the capacity development challenge that they had. And one was on Cox Bazaar and one was on Yemen. And it's recorded and available to watch. And we will continue the other webinars. Uh, my co-chair, Maddie, is not with us. She's in Gaza. And both of us have kind of been overwhelmed by all the other work that's been coming to us. So we've had this lovely webinar uh, and we'll be having more. We've been mostly supporting trained trainers in their work in rolling out the new training package. And we've been doing that by giving you a workaround to be able to get to the materials. And that's through a Google Drive. I want to mention that specifically because it's been really hard to get the materials. And we realize that and we acknowledge that. And so we want to make sure that you know about the Google Drive, because if you're going to the website to get it, it's not working so well. So that's another thing that we've done. And we are available to support you as much as you need. And um, Another achievement that we have is that we've been working with the Danish Refugee Council in um, strengthening some of the environment sessions because they were not um, very contextualized to our sector. And so we've been trying to do that. And thanks to DRC for giving us environmental experts. And we've also been working with the ABA Working Group. And it's a great time for me to hand over to Elena because I think she's next. Hi, thanks, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I'm Elena. I represent here the area-based approach working group. And uh, this year, we have been working on publishing new case studies. As many of you said, that the, you want to see more application of um, area-based approaches in site management. Uh, so we published three case studies. You can come and say hi tomorrow at the marketplace because we printed some copies if you haven't checked them online yet. Um, we have also organized a webinar with the Community Engagement Forum and Christine. 
and we focus on community engagement and different ways to engage the communities uh, in uh, um, area-based approaches inside management. And you can find the recording online if you're interested. Uh, the webinar focused on two of the case studies, the one on Burkina Faso and the one over uh, on Afghanistan. The Burkina Faso one I want to mention is available both in English and in French on the website. Um, we have also uh, been updating uh, regularly the list of re resources, relevant resources for ABA site management. So you find it on the website. Um, I try to um, update it regularly. You have links to uh, resources that can be case studies, uh, webinars, uh, online trainings, and so on and so forth. So check it, check this out. Um, we have also um, uh, translated the cluster position paper on Arabic approaches in French. So uh, now it's available in French, English, Arabic, and Spanish. And uh, you find it again on the website and the links are also in the uh, matrix uh, with, the, um, with the resources relevant for Arabic site management. And last but not least, um, capacity development. Uh, so we had further pilots of the Arab-based site management training. Um, the last pilot was conducted in Addis. You see a photo here. And um, it was multi-country and multi-agency. We had colleagues coming from Yemen. We had colleagues coming from uh, Latin America. We had colleagues coming from um, uh, Somalia, so South Sudan, Ethiopia, obviously. It was a super enriching training. It helped us really finalizing the training package. We are hammering the last details. And hopefully, it will be online over the next week for trained trainers to um, download it. And uh, ah, and we have also been working on a video on a brief explainer on Arab based site management. If you want to check it out, the preview of the video, you can come to our session tomorrow. Uh, yes, for minimum standards for camp management, which is obviously co chaired with Jennifer. We, ooh, yeah. we have, uh, as we say, improved our relationship with the other humanitarian standards partnerships, um, LEGS, MSCP, SEEDS, if anyone, uh, I think mean, there should be a prize if people could name these. We did this through an interactive um, session looking at the complementarity of sectoral standards, looking at what not necessarily divides us, but what unites us. Um, this session, uh, elements of it will be repeated at the marketplace. Um, as part of that, we developed activity cards for interactive training use. Uh, Mathilde has been in Copenhagen all of last week, laminating and cutting out 20 packs of minimum standards for camp management activity cards. These are exclusive merchandise that is only available here in Nairobi, uh, handmade. Uh, we uh, had a process of developing an e-learning course that is hosted on the Sphere platform. So elevating minimum standards from camp management beyond the cluster into its rightful place amongst the HSB partners. We have translated into Bangla Again, it is not an easy process. Uh, Moldovan plus Arabic, Dari, French, Korean, Pashto, Polish, Spanish, Turkish, and Ukrainian. I have already had people asking us where's Somalia. It's coming. Um, and if people want to see um, their own language, then come find me and Jennifer and explain how you're going to translate it because we um, and we can support in that. We have explainer videos, uh, both in Shong, uh, Shong, short and long form explaining what is the minimum standards for camp management. These are available now in, again, multiple languages, including um, Somali, so a step uh, closer uh, to a full translation. These are available on the CCCM cluster YouTube page. And then lastly, uh, the minimum standards for camp management now find themselves um, included um, in forming and embedded within 
Ukrainian uh, or the Ukrainian government's policy on collective centers. So again, elevating it beyond the cluster into governmental policy that will last um, on. Um, for the future, massive online training courses coming later this year. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, yeah, it has been um, a year of uh, work behind the scenes. We have uh, ongoing energy projects with uh, 15 uh, IOM and UNHCR operations uh, all around the world from uh, Venezuela to, to Chad to uh, Mauritania. Uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, projects going on and uh, gathering a lot of knowledge and uh, experience on how to improve access to energy and how to include that in a holistic uh, environmental approach in uh, emergencies and also in, and more general in settlements and camps. Uh, but uh, this first day, uh, should be a way to invigorate the way the working group is set up. We need your contributions. Should it be community of practice related? Should it be concrete tasks? Should it be other ways to to keep the work group pushing for energy and environmental in humanitarian uh, responses. Uh, we will uh, have a very interesting session later with a lot of empirical examples and uh, field uh, data that uh, probably will inspire all of you in your uh, operations. Uh, and then um, we hope to uh, agree on <laughs> in the global level on how it will be set up. Um, I think that's uh, more or less it. Uh, engage, and uh, it will be uh, very interesting to have your opinion in on the later session. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Kristin, and I work with NRC. Um, and I moderate this community of practice for the CCM cluster. Um, so this is a community of practice on engaging affected communities in displacement responses. Um, we're part of the cluster, the CCM cluster, but it's um, interagency and it's also intersectoral, intercluster. Um, we have members and experts from outside of the clusters and sectors, even from different networks and academia. Um, we're over 200 experts in this um, community of practice, all sharing um, resources and tools and experiences and expertise on engaging the displaced community and other affected population groups in displacement responses. And I will welcome you all to join us. Um, uh, we are also on LinkedIn where we have over 10,000 followers. So there's a lot, a lot of um, tools and expertise shared. Um, Everyone's always asking for more examples on how, how do you engage the, the displaced community? How do you engage authorities? How do you engage um, the local organizations? Come join us in the community of practice in the community engagement forum. And uh, we will all share with you. Um, we're we're uh, facilitating a session. Are you rushing me? <laughs> on, oh, okay. Uh, on um, uh, community engagement in CCCM. Uh, where we will introduce a training, um, a pilot training. Um, myself and Clara is here, and uh, uh, with Jenny as well from uh, the CCM and Shelter Cluster in Myanmar, where we piloted it online a couple of weeks ago, and we will be in Nigeria um, next week. So please come and join us in that session um, tomorrow, uh, where we need your uh, feedback on this uh, pilot training package and what you want to include. And uh, don't be shy to, to also discuss community engagement on all the days, not just tomorrow. 
Um, as you know, community engagement is important for accountability in all topics. Um, so we'll also be at the, um, uh, at the marketplace tomorrow. Um, and uh, we have a couple of the advisory board members as well here. There's uh, Philip and, uh, hi Philip, and uh, Emmy is here. And I'm gonna make them also join me at the stall tomorrow. So um, come and find me today, tomorrow, um, any day uh, to discuss community engagement and how we can join the forum. Um, I think I've said everything. Thanks, Kristin, and, and all the others. And, and you, you can make Kristin's dream come true if you also all join the LinkedIn um, account as well to make it to 10,000, yeah? All right, over to you, Dirk. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Juan and, and, uh, and the colleagues. Um, again, I would like to repeat that we are delighted to have you, uh, colleagues, um, we know many of you, we are in touch, some of them here uh, we have seen through the year and other colleagues we have not met, only we are meeting again in annual meetings. We hope um, the situation will allow us to meet more often because as I was discussing with a colleague today, that despite all the technology, nothing has ever replaced the direct face-to-face -face meeting. And here humanity wins, I would say. Nothing is similar for us to be together. It requires a lot of preparation, but it clearly is very much worth it. Um, my presentation will be complementing what the other colleagues have been presenting. It's about you, it's about all of us. It's about what the cluster has done in one year in numbers. I will move immediately to the next one here, just to tell that um, a few months ago, I have been sitting with a very senior humanitarian colleague. And he told me as a CCCM cluster, what is your narrative? What would you start telling as a cluster coordinator to to attract my attention, to make me understand and start and listen to you. What exactly is the importance of you in each and every country? What do you do as a cluster? This was a very important thing for us to know what our narrative is. And sometimes I think we are so good that we do the work and sometimes we don't do the talk. And that, this is really important for us as a cluster to also find the time to be able to advocate for ourselves. And this requires also a lot of work between us as a global cluster and all the country sectors, not only the cluster coordinators, but also all the different participants here. Teamwork with the donors, with the governments, with the practitioners, with the sectors, whether the cluster is activated or not. And also because we are cross-cutting, as you know that we are blessed to having not only CCCM, actors here, but we have many AORs, other clusters and other practitioners, etc. So we all have to work together to bring this narrative. It is really important because our job for us sometimes sounds clear, accountability, uh, uh, cross-cutting, difficult work that we do on a daily basis, but to make others also aware of that and to learn from each other is not always that easy. And this is really important for us to look at. In 2023, we have worked for 22 million internal displaced persons. That's a large number. It has been steadily increasing for reasons we all understand what's happening in this world. Unfortunately, the conflicts, the disasters linked up, multi multifaceted is unfortunately increasing. So the number of the people we have worked for is increased, has increased from, from the last years. We have different coordination mechanisms in 27 countries. Um, as we know, probably the, the global uh, humanitarian overview is nearly 34. So we are active in the majority of the countries. And once again, it's really important to tell that the CCCM cluster has been the most activated cluster in the past three years among all other clusters. This is just an indication, but also it's not really important whether there is an active cluster or not. Whenever there is an active working group or an active sector, we are here to support and we are here to work together. There is really no preference. They are together. Of course, sometimes the resources 
are different. But the non-activation often also belongs in some other context to other reasons rather than need space. Sometimes there are political reasons, sometimes there are resource reasons, etc. So keep in mind that we don't always want to CCCM be activated as a cluster to work with the country, but we can support regardless whenever there is a justified coordination uh, mechanism. Now, of the 22 million, 18 million IDPs live in IDP sites. Large number. We have been doing this in all countries. What I would like to really say here, what the narrative is, in general, there are many discussions that let's look for solutions. Let's not promote camps. Let's not support IDP sites. Sometimes there are even some misperceptions that the CCCM cluster is not taking into consideration that the sites will take longer time to bring solutions to. Sometimes we are promoting, sometimes we are not thoughtful, not strategic. This is very wrong. Most of us and the vast majority of us are very experienced. We know that sites will cause problems in the long term. We know that we should not promote sites, but still 40% of IDPs, according to our recent analysis, 40% of IDPs live in sites. So whatever we say about site closures, we should not work for sites, has to be rethought. Those 40% of IDPs live in sites because our calls for alternatives has not been so far valid or not possible. In some conflict setups, there are no other ways but for people to establish sites. And in many cases, it's not us establishing sites, it's people establishing sites for themselves. And unfortunately with this, it's not a situation we like, it's not a situation we want to happen, but it is happening. What we can say always, and every time a colleague asks me why the sites are increasing and CCCM is what are you doing? I say the CCCM exists in a country whenever we have a CCCM actors, we would have lesser sites than without CCCM. Because before we establish sites, we take all the measures to reduce the numbers of the sites in different countries. We don't want people to end up in sites, but we should not hold people accountable when there are no other solutions. We should support them. And this is our core accountability. This is the people-centered approach. And we will keep doing that. We need to really clear our narrative and improve it. Now, with nearly 300 partners, much more than this, by the way, this number is just taken from the HMP, uh, from the HPC. Majorly of them, many of them are local colleagues, local organizations, civil society actors, of course, governments and the authorities. A large number, so thanks to the effort of those people, our work is happening in these uh, countries. As we discussed this already, we are not going to go too much into details of that one, but yes, this is the total number of IDPs. It's important to raise the flag, say that 40% of the IDPs live in sites, different types of sites. This is, this is the important part of our narrative. So when we speak the language, we want to always support it by evidence. This came all from you. Everybody wants to get this information. This is the key data for us. This is our language. This is our voice. Without this, we are not able to advocate for resources. Knowing how many IDPs live inside compared to the total number of IDPs in each country is the first entry point for us to tell, here is the gravity of the situation. Because by the way, that day I was sitting with the World Bank, one document came to me, an independent evaluator said that, I would like to have an interview with you because 1% of IDPs live in camps. I said, if 1% of IDPs live in camps, you don't need to waste your time with me. It's a waste of time. If, if World Bank, if others are using this data, there's no need. But your data is wrong. 40% of IDPs live in camps. So go, please correct everywhere the data. When we speak about some camps, specific, formal, etc., the percentages will be different. But formal, informal, different size is not 1%. This is very wrong. It's 40%. Uh, now... It is also really essential for us to see what kind of typology of sites are there. Still, largest number live in planned sites. It's, it's true as well that uh, uh, many of them go to the sites where there is a specific level of plan, etc. But many, many IDPs live in different typologies of sites. As you see that we have IDPs live in informal settlements, 
The largest number of settlements, by the way, are informal settlements, and then many other collective centers and the different types of setups. So there are different places because sometimes the names are different. We don't always make informal camps for the people. People sometimes find solution because they are better aware of where the safeties are. Of course, this has negative impacts sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to maintain a protection situation. Some of the sites geographically are prone to different weather conditions or conflict areas, etc. But sometimes because we are also not able, the population themselves are able to identify informal sites for themselves and live there. And then again, we find ourselves in a de facto situation to help them and the, uh, to support them. Uh, once again, we are just going to the data. We will not uh, uh, explain each country, but these are important information that we are receiving from the cluster and the clusters. We have many IMOs here sitting as well. We don't have a language. So thank you, IMOs, for helping us. Thank you for working with Brian and Gabriel to unify this language. This one and I are able to advocate with this data much more than we are able to advocate with words. The data is really able to tell lots of stories of narrative of realities. Here is the situation. We can say that 40% of IDPs live in camp. And said, give me more information. Then we can go say, here is the situation in Ukraine. That's the situation in Afghanistan, DRC, long crisis, Somalia, etc. In many cases, we also like why people are not returning, how the numbers have increased in the past years while everyone's speaking about solutions. Yes, we want solutions, but why the numbers are increasing there? It is important. Other Examples from different countries. So again, just on a detail on how many IDPs live in what kind of typologies. And this just shows us also one thing that the colleagues were explaining to us is each country has its own different context. In some countries, we have the largest number of sites, but the number of IDPs in site is small. In some other countries, we have a smaller number of sites, but the number of IDPs there is large. Now, how to analyze this is, again, another narrative. But it's really important to read the story behind. Why in Somalia we have very large sites hosting very large IDPs? Why in other countries we have something different? So we sit, we often sit and think and discuss ourselves as a global cluster team. And we come to ask you, these stories are really important to know why. Why it's happening? Is it because... Is, is anything will change if we are going to say we are not working in the camps? We think no, because people will end up very vulnerable. So the stories will help us better plan the future. And especially with the fact we are having solution becoming one of the main pillars of the humanitarian work, it is really important for us to have uh, details of these um, stories. Uh, this again, I mentioned still the largest number of our partners are national partners. That includes the local authorities, civil society organizations, national non-governmental organizations. And then we are working, of course, with many international organizations. And here are the statistics by country. Some of them needs to be updated. Some of them are missing. So we are just giving you a kind of a snapshot. But we are working with the clusters to get this data. Now, today, I said hello to many of you. And I said, how are you? I think each of you, cluster cluster, we are very good, but we are having a really difficult financial situation. This was always the second answers we have received. And I think we all know that the financial situation, the humanitarian uh, 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 response is facing immense and very difficult circumstances. Now, the, the fact that we're advocating for one, myself and other colleagues is that the needs are increasing, the request, to cover these needs will require more funding. We have to come with clearer, more concrete languages that will help us raise funds. And we need to really reach out to different actors. And we have to also be able to convince that from the accountability perspective. It's really becoming very, very important to, for us to work together. And a country really has to bring us to this level because we are nobody without you. We cannot advocate for funds without you. So as you see that the funding kept increasing the HRP requests. Now, again, it does not tell how much of this will fund. We have another page for that one. Kept increasing in 2024, we phased to cap. The overall humanitarian overview, as you can know, it has decreased in 2023 compared to 2022. This was a, a kind of a, a very unique phenomena, but we were under a lot of pressure to prioritize. It does not mean that the needs 
are covered by this amount. I think that we need double or triple to cover the needs in 2023, but we were under the pressure. So the decrease in the last year is not only CCCM, but overally happened at all clusters level. Uh, here we have another very interesting analysis on funding requested and funding received. Many countries have requested, but then because of different situations, some countries really received a very good amount compared to what they have asked. Other countries have received very little. It's really important for us to see why and discuss among each other and to see what kind of advocacy mechanism was the fundraising, et cetera, in, in different uh, countries. Uh, now, my last slide, just um, I will go through this very, very quickly. So we have done our usual CCPM, as you know that this is a survey we do on what the clusters, what the cluster partners, what the different actors thinks about the performance of the cluster in each country. We are not going to name and shame here, but overally, I think that the majority are satisfactory with what we are doing as CCM cluster. Uh, still large number, nearly 30, 34, 35% are very happy with the performance of the CCM cluster in different countries. As we always say that the CCM cluster, and as one mentioned in the evaluation, in the ASCII evaluation, we have seen as very close to people, and we have seen as very operational, and we have seen as very realistic. And also, our cross-cutting nature as a cluster has been recognized. A camp is not only one sector. It has different clusters. We have to enable the other clusters to respond. And we know what does that mean as a cluster coordinator in each operations. We sit with each cluster, each actor, to tell what exactly is the unique need of the sites. Sometimes we say, don't do this because it will create more harm than the other. They are both called wash, but they are different ways of providing the method. So the multi uh, cross-cutting nature of the cluster has been highly acknowledged and recognized. The different types of activities, as we see, once again, reflectively, there has been some building capacity, not very much, but as you see, majorly, the different the colleagues who uh, provided their response to the survey expressed that they are happy with what the CCCM cluster is doing. Um, I think with this strategy update, I give it to uh, Charlie. He will give us another very interesting update on what is happening with this strategy. Now, I just want to, to tell before that, in the beginning, Charlie said that he is not suspicious. For me, he is suspicious because for somebody who managed to facilitate this number of CCCM meetings and still take care of the strategy development and is still alive and be willing to do this job, I think this is suspicious. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks very much there. And to Juan and all the working groups as well, a really interesting update on where we are. I'm gonna be really brief with you here on strategy because I know it's a lot of presentation to listen to in the morning, but I thought it would be useful to give you an update because I know almost everybody here has been involved in one way or another. So just to tell you very quickly what we've done. Well, it started last year. So I don't know if you remember, but last year in Geneva, I got you to do some activities where you were writing things on flip charts and then moving from table to table and then scoring them and prioritizing them. Well, they didn't go anywhere. Those huge flip charts got rolled up and taken to London and they sat in my flat under my desk for a long time with my wife saying, when are you gonna do something with the flip charts? And I said, I know them very, very important. When are you gonna clear away the flip charts? And I did one day, I just, I just wrote it all up and I've analyzed it and it's fascinating. So thank you. That was contributed with inputs from the strategic advisory group and discussions with them. And then workshops with you and partners, and we had four workshops, and 48 of you were involved, and those discussions were amazing. I don't know, hands up in here who was in one of those workshops? There were a few. Yeah, the online workshops, that's right. They were some really, really good discussions, really opened my eyes to some of the challenges you're facing and the strengths you demonstrate as well in, in the different operations. I've been conducting interviews and interviews and interviews and interviews with the great and the good of the humanitarian world and some others too. And we've spoken to governments, donors, national NGOs, international NGOs, plus the lead agencies, the IASC and OCHA and others too. So we've got a huge amount of information from there too. And then finally, we conducted a survey for which we had 71 responses. We had a French and an English version. 
And I just, I'm not going to show you all the details from the survey, but there were a couple of interesting things. Firstly, if you look on the left, you see that operational partners were the main contributors to our survey, which is really great. I'm really pleased with that. What really surprised me and really made me think was the, the pie chart on the right. We asked people when they took the survey, have you been affected by displacement directly? And I was amazed that the 49 of our 71 respondents have been directly affected. And it was cause for me to pause and remember that many of you and many of our operational partners continue to do the amazing work you do, despite all the concerns and stresses that you have to face yourself. So for me, that was a moment to pause and, and to thank you for what you do. Thank you. What did I find from all this? People wanted to clap there. Go on, clap if you want to clap. I made a bit of a complicated Miro board. It's huge. There were about 8,000 post-its on it, and my brain was spinning for days and weeks. And I tried to gather it together. And here I've listed 16 of the things that came out. This isn't all of them but these were sort of really common and main themes. And I've deliberately mixed them up, not to make it difficult for you to read, although it probably is, but because it's mixed in my head too, because very often the things that make you strong, such as what we're really good at is, is managing camps and coordinating camps and listening to people's needs and referring for services and monitoring services and ensuring those services get delivered. But then they're also the things that make it complicated because then we get these challenges that Dare was talking about in terms of, but is this camp helping people to reach solutions? And, and this work to, to be really in touch and to be speaking with people all the time and to have so many partners means that cluster coordinators are incredibly busy, incredibly busy. And that makes it very hard to balance all these different needs. One of the strengths is that we know we have incredible information. Everybody said this to me. Everybody says to me in all the interviews, they all say what the CCCM cluster has is this accessibility and this closeness to communities and therefore this understanding. And this information is vital. And it's really vital, not just for the immediate needs, but also for the longer term solutions. But then people say to me, but we don't, we're not able to invest enough in our information management. We don't have enough people working on information management. And if we're going to invest in that, then we should be investing in cluster coordinators as well. And so every one of these strengths, every one of these attributes brings with it a challenge, I think. And we're starting to try to untangle that to work out the way we go forwards. For me, and this is a very personal opinion, and I don't understand your world as well as you do, but the greatest strength is the one I just mentioned. It's that your proximity to communities affected by displacement is incredible. And your work on community engagement and your understanding of their needs, their aspirations and their actions, because it's not just about needs, is beyond anything else, I think, at the moment. And dare I say it, I think that at a local level, this is the community that is best placed to gather that information and pass it to others. And I've had conversations with the UN Ocha and I've told them that, and sometimes they like it and sometimes they don't, but it's what I think. I don't, I don't matter, I'm an independent consultant, so that's okay. At least that sometimes, yeah, just sometimes. But your biggest challenge is pretty much this one here, right? It's what Dare was describing, the camps problem and the, and the issue of mandate and what do we do? And you're in this really tough balance between on one side, no one else is doing this. 40% of IDPs are in camps and we need to meet these needs because people have needs and we need to do it well with dignity, safely and accountably. And you do it really, really well. And on the other side, We absolutely advocate for anything other than camps whenever we can, and we need to keep doing that. And so we're asking people, cluster coordinators, to do their job this way, and then this way, and then this way, and then this way, and sometimes it's really short term, and sometimes it's long term. And in the midst of all that, there's this big mandate confusion, I think. 
And that's what we want to sort out. So don't worry, we'll do it. I'll have it with you by tomorrow morning. Don't worry, it's fine. Maybe not tomorrow morning, but soon. So just to show you one thing that I think has come out, and I can't show you a great deal because we don't have a great deal at the moment. And this is a little bit of a pitch from me, but it's a pitch that's gone through the eyes of the people who matter. Um, I think there should be four really key strategic aims. Now, this is not to describe what you do. Strategic aims are not to describe the work you do. It's to describe that view over to the horizon. So whilst we're working, we keep our eyes over there and we look to the horizon and we think about what do we need to keep in our heads? And I think it's these four things. So we should try to avoid the establishment of camps wherever possible. And that does mean, I think, working outside of camp environments, which I know so many of you are already doing. We should try to support solutions from the start. And that data that I was talking about is super helpful for that. Really, really helpful. And even the data gathered from, from camp situations gives us a really good insight to the needs of people outside of camp situations. Because very often they're coming from the same challenges. The third one contains so much, right? For me, it contains this issue of a people-centered approach. It contains an issue of listening to people. It contains an issue of working closely with communities, gathering that data, sharing that data with other actors so we ensure that they, they use that data in the best possible way, holding them to account and seeing the, the change we need. And then fourthly, and this frustrates me. For anyone who's had a conversation with me, you know I kind of I get a bit cross about this because I think as a sector we've been talking about localization and localization and localization for a very long time. Well, we need to get real. We need to be bold and brave and shift wherever we can responsibility to national and local actors. And that requires, I think, some tough decisions. I think right from the very beginning, we need to be making those decisions when we're talking about activation, even pre-activation. You know, is there someone else who could be doing this or should we phone the fire brigade from Geneva? Just a question. And again, I'm an independent consultant. Nobody shoot me. <laughs> <laughs>